All right. Well, we are in Acts chapter 8, as we continue our series going verse by verse through the book of Acts. And we're going to surprisingly start in actually in verse 1a. So we're going to break it down. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Now that's the first mention of Saul. Now we just got through in chapter 7 talking about how Stephen, you know, was martyred. And we read that story and, and we, you know, kind of see how cool that was and quite a great testimony and a great witness. But at the same time, I think a lot of times we look over things. For instance, Stephen, he had a family. He had friends. Was everybody so excited about what happened to, to Stephen? In other words, uh, why would be a question. And I think sometimes we think, well, you know, they, they, those guys are so full of faith that they didn't have a question of why. But I think we overlooked that. They had a question of why. And that's all right to have a question of why. And I think as we get farther into Acts, we're going to come to the point where uh, James, brother John, sons of thunder, and James is, says, was killed by Herod by the sword. Okay, that just kind of mentions that briefly. And then it goes on to Peter. Then Herod arrests Peter because it pleased the Jews. And he was planning to do that to Peter. And then Peter gets this miraculous deliverance. In fact, you know, where he's asleep and the angel comes in, kicks him, and get up, get out, you know, and... and he thinks he's, he's dreaming or he's seeing a vision or something. And so he walks out and goes through the gates and all the soldiers, you know, right past the soldiers and, and doesn't really come to himself until he's walking down the street. Okay, now that, that's a great and glorious uh, deliverance. But uh, what I wonder about, what was John thinking? That's my brother. Why? Why was James, and he was in the inner circle, James, John, Peter, why was he allowed to be martyred? Peter was miraculously delivered. And I think, again, sometimes we overlook that. We, we just think, oh, well, those guys are so full of faith. No, they, they had questions. You know, in fact, in that long list of where Paul gives a long list about being beaten and da 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 one of the things he says, perplexed. In other words, he didn't really understand what God was doing. Didn't necessarily make sense all the time. And we're in that same place. We don't always know, and we won't know many times until we get to heaven. So it's all right to have questions, to ask the Lord, and most of those answers we won't get till we actually get there. But again, put yourself in the story and feel their emotions as you begin to read through this. So that's verse 1a. Let's read 1b. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So I look at that verse, and I say, it's like the Lord is saying, we can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. Now, they were very comfortable in the church in Jerusalem, all together, comfortable, church is growing, things are going great. But if you go back to chapter 1 of Acts and verse 8, what was the last thing that uh, Jesus told them? Let me turn over there real quick. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that was their instructions. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But they were comfortable staying where they were, enjoying fellowship. And so you have two different forces at work. You've got the enemy, Satan, who's bringing persecution. He has his plans. God has his plans, which is, I'll use that persecution to scatter them so that they begin to go out to do what I told them to do originally. So again, it's, it's kind of like that. We can do it two ways. We can do it the hard way, or we can do it the easy way. Unfortunately for a lot of us, we do things the hard way. All right. So verse 2 and 3, we'll take two together here. So godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Well, see, they were mourning deeply for him. It was a loss. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. We've got a couple other instances where uh, Paul in Acts chapter, let's look at those, Acts chapter 22, the first one where he, he admits and tells others what he was before he came to that saving knowledge of Jesus. And in verse 22, or chapter 22, verses 4 and 5, and he says, well, I'm going to go back actually to... Uh, where he says, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of, the, of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So not only was he persecuting Christians there in Jerusalem, but it was almost like there was an obsession that he was going to wherever the Christian was, and he actually thought he was doing God a favor, okay, in this persecution. And in uh, chapter 26, he again goes on, this is when he's before King Agrippa, after he's been taken a, a prisoner in Jerusalem. And verses 9 through 11, he says, I too was convinced that I, I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death... I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blasphemy. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. So again, he even admits he was obsessed with persecuting those who believe Jesus, the Messiah. Now, unfortunately, true Christianity should never persecute anyone. We should always stand for truth, and we never compromise with truth, but we should never persecute other religions. We should never uh, physically do anything, even... Uh, Unfortunately, in church history, that has not been the case. I mean, you go back through the Inquisition from the Catholic Church, but it wasn't only the Catholic Church, it was also Protestant churches were persecuting other Protestants because they didn't baptize the way we think they ought to be baptized. And they were burning people at the stake. 
And you know, that, that never works. Only, you can only be converted. You can't force somebody. You can force somebody to say the words, but you must believe in your heart. And so, like, uh, what did Jesus tell the disciples? He said when he sent out the 12, when he sent out the 7, he said, you know, if they reject you, just shake the dust off your feet, go to the next town. Now, James and John thought it was a good idea. Let us call down fire. You know, burn those guys. They reject us. You know, you don't know what spirit you are. So we have to realize church history is not always, uh, hasn't always been very glorious. We have made a lot of mistakes throughout history. Okay, verse 4 and 5. Now, those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. Okay, so Philip goes down to Samaria. Now, a lot of you kind of remember, you know, the, the actually racial prejudice, the religious prejudice that the Jews had against the Samaritans. And we, you, you kind of have to know who the Samaritans really were, because sometimes they say, well, they're half-breeds. Well, no, that's part of the story, but that's not the whole story. Because what happened, you have to go back in history, because where Samaria is, was after the division of the kingdom from Judah and Israel, Israel with the 12 tribes in the north, Judah and Benjamin with the two tribes in the south, so after the division, and, and they were at war with one another, they had a, you know, a civil war. Sometimes they were together, sometimes they were fighting each other. But uh, the northern kingdom, which was originally started by Jeroboam, he didn't want his people going to Jerusalem to worship. So he set up uh, calves, idols, to worship in Bethel, and then one in Dan up in the north, so that his people wouldn't go down to worship at Jerusalem, okay? So, so they became, they, they went into idolatry very quickly. And even though the Lord would send prophet after prophet to them, they would not listen. They continued to worship other gods until finally in 722 B.C., the Lord sends and uses the Assyrians. And it's always interesting because Assyrians were and, you know, a very pagan, cruel people, and yet that's who God used to bring judgment upon Israel. So they come down. They, uh, it was a horrible siege, like in Samaria. Uh, it resulted in actually cannibalism within those in, in, in Samaria. So the ones who survived that what they would do, the Syrians would take the survivors, they would take them, and they would move them and put them in another nation. And then they would take people from another nation, and they put them in that nation. So the point was that if you cut people off from their roots, they're less likely to revolt. So the Syrians did that, the Babylonians also did that, in 586 B.C. when they came down against Jerusalem. So you have these people who have been brought from someplace else, who have their own gods, who are now living in what used to be the northern kingdom, which is called Israel. So I want to give you a scripture for us to look at. So go to 2 Kings chapter 17. And it kind of gives us a little snapshot of that. 2 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to start uh, in verse 23, and we're going to go to 29. It says, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuth, Ava, Hamath, Sepharim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria. 
to replace the Israelites. Now they took over Samaria and lived in its towns. Now when they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord, which is, I think, very interesting. Did not worship the Lord, so he sent, that's the Lord, sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. And obviously the people knew that this wasn't just an accident or it wasn't just a normal thing. Something's going on here. So it was reported to the king of Assyria, the people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria do not know what the God of this country requires. And he has sent lions among them, which are killing them off, because the people do not know what he requires. Then the king of Assyria gave this order. Have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back there to live and teach the people what the God of the land requires. So one of the priests who had been exiled from Samaria came to live in Bethel and taught them how to worship the Lord. Nevertheless, each national group made its own God in their several towns where they settled and set them up in the shrines. So the people of Samaria had made at the high places. So, these people didn't know the Lord. The Lord sends lions, kills a lot of people, and they realized something's going on here. They complained to the king of Assyria. He sends a priest back to teach them how to worship the Lord. But the problem is, it's a mixture. Because they're worshiping Yahweh, but they're also worshiping other false gods. So you got this mixed, mixed bag going on with the people, and that's why the Jews look down so much upon the Samaritans. So that's kind of the, the history of where the Samaritans came, came from, how they got there. So we'll go back to Acts chapter 8. And what this also is a picture, because as we go through the book of Acts, there's a storyline that goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation, okay? And sometimes these places, that are, you just think, well, this town or this country or what's that all about? It has a meaning. There's, there's a purpose. There's a messaging that's going on that the Lord is trying to, uh, to let us know beyond what we're just reading on the surface, okay? So this land at one time was Israelite land. This was Israel until judgment came. So this, this land is being reclaimed, but it's not being reclaimed to the nation of Israel or the kingdom of Israel, is being reclaimed to the kingdom of God. Okay? And what we're going to find as we go through this, there was a struggle within the apostles for many that went all through the book of Acts, actually, for decades, about Gentiles. And not just Samaritans, but Gentiles in general. And it took a long time for them to get over that. So let's read um, verses 6 through 8. When the crowd heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all pay, paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in the city. So Philip, again, and you keep that straight too, there's two Philips. There's Philip who's an apostle, and there's Philip who 
who was one of the, those who served the tables. This is one of those who served the table, not, not the apostle. So he's performing signs and wonders, and he's not an apostle, just like Stephen was not an apostle, and he was performing signs and wonders. Okay? So he goes to Samaria, he's doing this, and then we're going to look at verses, let's see, let's go uh, 9 through 13. Now for some time, a man named Simeon had practiced sorcery, or Simon, now in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. Now he boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and explained, this man is the divine power known as a great power. Now they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, And the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now Simon Simon, Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles. So Simon, the sorcerer, previously... He was able to do a lot of powerful things. In other words, it'd be like back in the Exodus, you know, when Moses came and, and he did different, you know, had Aaron throw down his staff and it turned into a snake. And, but the sorcerers or the magicians of, of Egypt were able to do the same thing. In fact, you get about halfway through that they were able to duplicate the same power. So there's definitely power in the occult, and in dark magic. And I think we're going to be seeing probably more and more of that in the future. So we can't be swayed by even miracles. But, he, but there was a power. But even he, even Simon, believed and was baptized. Now, there's a, a great division, I guess you could say, among scholars. Was Simon truly converted, or was he not? And you see some on both sides, because it does say he believed, and he was baptized. And then later, in a few verses, we're going to see that it seems like, well, eh, I don't know for sure about that. But... You, you guys can make your own decision on that as you, as you read through it. Whether he really was the real deal or whether or not. Okay, verse 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Okay, so why are Peter and John going to them? I think the real reason is it was for Peter and John. Because they're going, can Sumerians really be saved? Those people? Now, we got the report that says, hey, signs and wonders were happening and they've been baptized. But, because, remember, for them, it was all about, it's all been about Jesus, or Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. So, kind of stepping out of the comfort zone here, because, again, this was a struggle that went on for decades. For the Gentiles also, for the Samaritans, I don't know. And so it's been a, it was an ongoing struggle. Verse 15 through 17. 
Now, when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, they had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So was there something wrong with just being baptized in the name of Jesus? No, because earlier people had been baptized in the name of Jesus, and at the same time the Holy Spirit would fall on them. But in this case, it didn't. So the apostles come, they lay hands on them, and they receive, and we don't know for sure what all the physical manifestation was, but there's something because it's obviously they could see it, that these people received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I believe it was really for the benefit of Peter and John. Because they go, these guys have received the Holy Spirit just like we received the Holy Spirit. In fact, later when Peter you know, goes to Cornelius and the same thing happens. In fact, remember he has a vision and, and this tent or this sheet comes down to heaven with all sorts of crawly things and unclean things and and the, and the voice comes and says take and eat kill and eat and he goes no lord i have never eaten anything unclean and it does three times it comes down from heaven he says kill and eat and then about that same time those men from cornelius came to the door and the Spirit tells him, go down, don't fear, go with them. And he welcomes them in. And then when he goes to Cornelius, and his whole family is gathered there, they pray for him. He starts to, actually, he, he starts to give them the gospel message, and they rudely didn't wait till he finished, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. And then they go, how can this how, we can't prevent them from being baptized now because obviously they received the same Holy Spirit that we have seen. And so there is this ongoing struggle throughout the New Testament of even after that, you know, Paul has to confront Peter in Galatians and say, what are you doing? Because there are so many of, the, of uh, Jewish believers who said, hey, it's all right that... Uh, that you're saved, but you really need to become a proselyte of Judaism. You need to, to be circumcised. You need to follow the, the law, the Torah. And, and, and Paul's like, no. Even after Peter had already learned this himself. Okay, so the Holy Spirit falls on them. And I believe, again, it's, it's much for the benefit of Peter and John as it was for, for those who, who were receiving it. All right, 18 to 24. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was giving at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen. So that kind of puts a negative light upon him. But still, there's a lot of questions, because he did seem to repent and ask them to pray for him. And you have to remember also that he was a brand new spanking believer, and he doesn't know anything from anything. So he thought, hey, I'd like to be able to do this. So, so anyway, you guys can kind of make your own decision about that. What do you think? 
when we get to heaven, we'll ask him if we see him. If not, I said, I told you I was right. All right. So we come down to verse 25. Now, when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So, as they're going back, now they are preaching the gospel to the Samaritans on their way back to Jerusalem. So, obviously, it had been a change of heart. They see now that this is not just for the Jews, but this is also for the Samaritans, for Gentiles, although again, it's going to be a struggle. Now we'll move on to the Ethiopian. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So an angel speaks to him, tells him to go to Gaza. Gaza's been in the news, obviously, a lot lately, right? And it's kind of the last watering hole before you go farther into the, the wilderness. And so it's interesting to me that, that God uses us, he uses Philip, he uses angels, he uses the heavenly hosts for his purposes. He doesn't need us, he doesn't need the heavenly hosts, but he chooses to work with us and with his heavenly host because he wants a family. So he uses an angel to escape, why not just have the angel go talk to him? In fact, I, I got a feeling maybe the Ethiopian probably thought that's who, that, who Philip was. Because when he disappears, he's going, you know, what happened here? But the, work, but the Lord works through people and his heavenly host. He chooses to do that. Okay, 27 to 29. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone up to Jerusalem and on his way home was setting, and he went up to worship, by the way, and on his way home he was setting in a chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. So Ethiopia at that time, which was in the Old Testament time, was known as Cush, would be south of Egypt, Sudan, what we call Sudan today. Uh, the Ethiopian language was a Semitic language related to Hebrew and to Aramaic. It was different but there were similarities. So the Lord tells, the Holy Spirit tells him to go join himself to this Ethiopian who's reading, had just come from Jerusalem. Obviously, he's a, a proselyte who had converted to Judaism. And he's reading, and as we see in verse 30, 33, he's reading Isaiah 53. Uh, just a coincidence, I'm sure. It says, then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from him, from the earth. So again, he just happens to be reading Isaiah 53 at that particular time when Philip just happens to come up and you talk about a divine setup, a divine appointment, divine timing, this was it. So he's reading that passage and he's got questions, you know, who's this passage talking about? Very confusing. So 34 through 38, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, They came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down, and Philip baptized him. So he presents the gospel and begins to go through the Old Testament, starting with Isaiah 53, explaining the good news about Jesus. And the eunuch was converted. He believed. And he asked, well, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? So it happens. Verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Astos and traveled about preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. So, all of a sudden, he baptizes him, comes up, and all of a sudden, Philip disappears. And you wonder what that Ethiopian, you know, his mouth is probably still open. Like, what happened here, you know? And and Philip finds himself in this town, Azotus, which is interesting, again, because it's not just an accident that that's there. Because that's the name in the Old Testament of the city of Ashdod. Remember Ashdod and Gath were the Philistine cities, okay? And they were enemies, obviously, of Israel. So despite the fact that this city has an evil, very evil past, the gospel goes forth. And people are converted in that city. Not to the kingdom of Israel, but to the kingdom of God. So all through this, you see, uh, you know, it's really theological messaging about reclaiming the nations to overturn what happened, actually, in both Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 11, and reclaiming the earth as the kingdom of God. And I want to go back in Deuteronomy chapter 32. We have the song of Moses. And what he does here, it's a long song. I'd like to hear you guys sing that sometime. Worship team, try that on. <clears throat> but he's giving... Basically, the history of Israel. And if you look at verses 8 and 9, as he's recounting this, and he says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, 
when he divided all mankind, which was the Tower of Babel, where he divided the languages, divided the nations, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted inheritance. So what he's doing, he took Israel, took you know, first Abraham and then he, the 12 tribes, and this is his inheritance. He gave these others to the, uh, to the sons of God. And if, you're, uh, if your translation says sons of Israel, that's a wrong translation. It says sons of God, meaning these he gave over those nations. But now, in this story that's going from Genesis to Revelations, he's reclaiming the nations. He's taking back those nations for the kingdom of God. And so we see this story we just begin to unfold again all the way from Genesis to Revelation till we see the con- accumulation of when the Lord comes back. And all the nations, it said before the end comes, every nation will have a witness. Every ethnic group will have a witness of the word of God. And each will have an opportunity to make a choice. To either reject or to receive him. But again, because of the the background of, of the Jewish mindset, the Israelite mindset, you know, once those ten tribes were taken away and lost, basically, into history, you had the, the southern kingdom only left, Judah, Benjamin, the two tribes. And they did not call themselves Jews, by the way. It, it was the Babylonians who called them Jews because they were from Judah. And so it was very hard for them to make this step that this was more than about them. I mean, we all like to be kind of the in-group, you know, our church or our, our denomination. Or, and so it was the same with them. You know, this, this is for us. You know, we're the chosen. We're the blessed ones. And so it took a long time for them to realize that this story is a lot bigger than about one group of people, about one nation. But this is about reclaiming the world for Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have a plan, that you have a purpose, that you are working out that plan and that purpose. And Lord, that we get to be a part of it, that you choose weak and failing people like us to help accomplish what you have in your heart. So, Lord, I, I just thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. And, Lord, even for those times when we don't understand what's going on, when we have the whys, why, Lord? Why this? Why not that? Why wasn't this prayer answered? You have answers. You have a purpose. And your ways are higher than our ways. So, Lord, we just say we trust you. We trust you. Our faith is in you. So, Lord, we just say, Lord, we love you. Our heart's desire is to know you more. Our heart's desire is to know your ways, to walk with you in an intimacy with you, a deeper understanding, to be your hands and feet in the earth today. And Lord, even as we go, as we go, whether it's send to a foreign nation or whether it's we're going to our job, to Walmart, whatever it is, that we are carriers of your presence. Lord, that you would remind us of that, Lord. 
that we have that living spirit of God living within us, that we are your hands and feet today. And Lord, just as Philip and Stephen were in that sense laymen, Lord, that you would use all of us, Lord. Lord, that we would realize that we all carry that same spirit within us, that you have given us authority to minister to others. And Lord, that we would be asking you, Lord. We'd say, Holy Spirit, show us someone. Holy Spirit, work within us. Lord, give us words of knowledge. Give us a word of wisdom. Give us, Lord, that gift of healing. Lord, give us discernment. That gift of faith and the working of miracles. Lord, that we might minister to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I'm asking for an increase of anointing upon this whole congregation, Lord. That every one of us are carriers of your presence. And that we would be as Philip, as Stephen, that as we go, we would realize that same spirit lives within us, and that we would yield to the Holy Spirit. And we always welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your work. Lord, we ask that you renew our minds by the washing of your word, that you would increase your anointing in our lives, that you would increase the power in our lives, that we would have more love, more power, more of you in our lives, Lord. That each day we'd be growing in you. And Lord, that as we look at these examples throughout the book of Acts, Lord, we ask that you would do that once again, Lord. That you would increase your presence and your power. Because Lord, we know that when you walk in the room, everything changes. When your presence is manifest, things happen. So, Lord, we're crying out to you, Lord, for the more. Asking again, Lord, that you would rend the heavens, that you would pour out your spirit, that we would see true, authentic revival in our midst. Lord, we don't want to waste time with hype, with fakery, We want the authentic thing. We want you, Lord. We want your name to be exalted, to be lifted up. Lord, in our fellowship, but Lord, throughout this this Harrisonville, Lord, throughout this county, throughout this region, Lord, that your name would go forth. So, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing what you've done, and what you're going to do. And Lord, we have an anticipation, Lord, anticipating you moving on our behalf. Lord, these weak vessels stir hearts. Lord, for some of us who are older, I ask again, Lord, that you would stir the fire again. Many times, Lord, we get the the attitude, been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. But Lord, we want, to be, we want to be on fire. We want to be fresh with you. We want to desire what you desire. We want what you want, Lord. So Lord, break off any complacency. Lord, break off any things that have hindered us in the past whether it was things like an unanswered prayer or things didn't go as we thought they would go, but, Lord, that we would have a fresh fire that would burn within us. Do it once again, Lord. Lord, we're asking for a new day of Pentecost, for your fire to fall upon us, Lord. We want to be that dry wood, Lord, that will kindle quickly, that will be a raging fire. And Lord, we ask for your holy fire to burn up any dross in our life. 
Lord, those things that hold us back, those things that Hebrew calls those encumbrances, not just the sin, but the encumbrances that keep us from entering fully in to everything that you have for your people. Lord, we want to be genuine. We want to be real. We want to move in power, but we want to be humble, contrite, knowing that it's only you and has nothing to do with us. So, Lord, stir the hearts afresh and anew. Let that fire burn. Let it become a raging fire within us, where you become our magnificent obsession And nothing else has any importance. So, Lord, help us, Lord. Because we, again, say we are weak vessels. We're but flesh. But, Lord, breathe into us your spirit. We want to yield to the Holy Spirit. We say we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Spirit, come Holy Spirit, stir us right now, Lord. stir our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would release words of knowledge, words of wisdom, that prophetic word, even now. Lord, I ask for a boldness to come to your people. I ask for a hunger, a hunger that will not be satisfied that keeps running after you. So, Lord, do a work, even now, among us. Lord, release. Release your word now, Lord. We're asking for you, Lord. We just say, Lord, here we are. Presenting ourselves before you. What do you want to do, Lord? What do you want to do in us and through us, Lord? We'll have the microphone up here in front. Someone gets a, a prophetic word. Feel free to come up. And let's just wait a few minutes on the Lord. Okay, thanks. I don't have much voice today. So um, <clears throat> I just want to tell a small story. It's just it's really bugging me <laughs> this morning. For those of you that are, it's going to be a babbling moment like Steve here. <laughs> For those of you that are struggling with hope, I want to tell you that God knows you in an intimate way that you'll probably never understand. But for me, I have a small story. I lost a daughter. Her name was Savannah in a, uh, when she was 16 in a car accident. It's been several years ago. It's been about 10 years ago now. Um, <clears throat> I had forgotten uh, when she was about 14, 13, somewhere in there, her and her sister went to my mother for Father's Day, and they went and bought a little Timex watch for me because they thought I needed a wristwatch. And when I wear watches, they go dead. So it, it didn't take very long. A couple of weeks, it went dead, and I threw it in my drawer because it was from my, from my children. It was meaningful, but it wasn't purposeful. So she found it later on, uh, let's say 14, 15, somewhere down the road there, she found it, and she decided to do the creative art thing with it. She put it in a frame. She took the, the bezel out of the watch, put it in the center, hot glued it on a doily napkin that she created. And it says, in his time... Or in, in God's time, in God, time stands still. The backstory to that was six months after her death, I was looking at it sitting on my dresser, getting ready. To speak to a youth group. The watch stopped prior years before her death but the time of her death was on the watch and the date and the year 
were exactly when she passed away. Listen, Savannah didn't know what she was doing, but God knew me and his intimacy for me and for my resolve for that loss to deal with me. He left that and he used my daughter to leave it for me. So when you think God's not seeing you, I want you to know that he sees everything prior to that situation. He is exactly in that place with you. He is going ahead of you. And he's preparing things that you'll never be able to create in your own mind. So those are testimonies. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's something that is really intimate to me because it was from my little girl. So today, if you're without hope, realize that the intimacy of the Lord is he is watching and he is preparing and he is doing things on your behalf for you in a way that you'll never understand. But he's there. So Lord, we just thank you for that testimony of hope. Lord, that in the midst of tragedy, you bring hope, you bring a future. And Lord, I thank you for stirring hearts this morning, even Lord. And Lord, for that one who even felt kind of an unction or a stirring, Lord, I just ask that you would just cause that to grow in the coming weeks. That everyone has a ministry, everyone has a calling, everyone is a part of the body. And Lord, at this, there would be a, a, a complete breaking down of this, this, uh, this dividing wall between so-called clergy and laymen. We are all just servants of the Most High. So, Lord, I ask that you would empower again, infuse each one here, Lord, for their purposes. And, Lord, we give you this day. We ask that you would be glorified in it. I ask for your protection and blessing as each one goes their way today. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.